throughout my clinical practice, there's a few stories and a few patients I forget. And when I sift through those moments, there's one particular patient that always seems to come to the forefront. I am an endocrinology nurse practitioner, and I currently work at The Ohio State University Medical Center, and I work on the inpatient diabetes management consult service. And the first thing I do every morning when I come in is I kind of just take a glance at my, my census list. And this one particular morning a few years ago, this name just popped out at me. I mean, I knew this kid. This was a 22-year-old young man, and we're going to call him Andrew. And I knew Andrew because he was a patient at the pediatric practice that I used to work at. And I just remember Andrew had this great reputation at the practice. Um, I'd only seen him a few times because I wasn't his primary nurse practitioner, but I just remember he was such a nice kid. And I also remember he had a great mom. And pretty much, if you're growing up with type 1 diabetes, you better have a great mom. And he did. And I was actually surprised to see him on my consult list that day because Andrew had really well-controlled diabetes. He wore an insulin pump, he was extremely knowledgeable and proficient with its use, and he always had this great A1C. So I was curious to find out why had he been admitted to the hospital. So what I discovered when I looked into it is that Andrew had just moved out on his own, the first time living without mom, living without college roommates, and he had actually called his mom the night before he was admitted. And he said, Mom, you know, I'm just not feeling that good. You know, my stomach hurts a little bit. I'm a little bit nauseous, but I think I'm coming down with the flu. It's going around. And my blood sugars are a little bit higher because I'm getting sick, but I'm going to take care of it. And his mom kind of resisted that motherly urge to micromanage the situation because this was a young man. He was 22 years old. He was taking ownership of his own disease. And she said, OK, you know, I trust you. But she called him the next day. And she called him, and she called him, and he never answered. And when she drove over to his apartment, she found him alone in his apartment, unresponsive. And Andrew was rushed to the hospital in DKA. DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, that life-threatening complication that we're so concerned about with type 1 diabetes. You see, what Andrew didn't realize is that something had been blocking that delivery of life-sustaining insulin to his body. And Andrew was admitted to the hospital but he never woke up. And three days later, life support was withdrawn. This 22-year-old young man, at the beginning of his life, with the well-controlled diabetes, his mother's only child, he was gone. Andrew was gone with his first episode of DKA, and he never even saw it coming. This experience obviously had profound impact on me, but it wasn't just the fact that I knew Andrew. It wasn't just the fact, the pure tragedy of the situation, it was the fact that this wasn't supposed to happen. This wasn't supposed to happen because Andrew had well-controlled diabetes and because he'd received the best. He'd received the best education, he'd received the best management. And I knew this because he'd received those things at the practice I used to work at. And to this day, I so admire the care that they provide their patients. And if this could happen to Andrew, well, couldn't it happen to anybody? Just like Andrew, hundreds of thousands of individuals across the United States have chosen insulin pump therapy for the management of their diabetes. And ever since the Diabetes Complications and Control trial first published back in 1991, we've known that intensive insulin therapy prevents diabetic complications. And we have also over three decades of research really elevating pump therapy as the gold standard in the management of type 1 diabetes. Insulin pump therapy it not only gives individuals this precision in insulin delivery that allows for excellent glycemic control, but it also allows them to have this flexibility in their lifestyle that they just can't get with injections. As an endocrine nurse practitioner, proud certified diabetes educator and pump trainer, I've had the opportunity to train and witness scores of individuals begin pump therapy, embrace this technology, and really improve their quality of life but I've also seen some pretty significant adverse outcomes associated with pump therapy, and I'm not alone. In 2010, the FDA launched an investigation really looking into adverse outcomes associated with pump therapy. And actually, just a few months ago, the American Diabetes Association launched a similar inquiry. And you know what they found? They found that this piece of technology, this insulin pump, is really pretty safe and it's effective. But nonetheless, pump malfunctions and failures do occur. But what I found to be far more concerning 
is that in the vast majority of adverse outcomes, the driving force was actually the hands that held the pump, the individual. And a single adverse event can have devastating consequences depending on the response of the individual, and yet they're relatively common. Um, a recent study found that nearly 40% of patients surveyed said that they had had an adverse event just that past year. And the scope of potential outcomes from a single adverse event is incredibly broad. Uh, on this end of the spectrum, you have a few hours of hyperglycemia, some increased blood glucose monitoring, probably a major inconvenience in your day, but it's taken care of, it resolves. And then on this end of the spectrum, on the far other side, you have a hospitalization, coma, and death. Yeah, and I've seen every single one of those. And the fact that this broad scope of outcomes is directly related to the individual's response means that theoretically, outcomes on this end of the spectrum should be 100% preventable, and yet they continue to occur. In their reports, both the FDA and the American Diabetes Association said that they felt that adverse outcomes could be prevented in the future with improvements to patient selection and improvements to pump education. You see, unlike Andrew, many individuals that begin pump therapy only have one session of pump education spanning several hours. And we know that people don't learn well this way. Nobody learns well this way. We learn so much better when information is chunked off into smaller sections and kind of spread out over time. And we know that we learn really, really well when inc information can be incorporated into our everyday lives and we can really experience it. And I think that this is one of the things that makes training for diabetic and pump emergencies so difficult because thank God we don't experience them every day. You know, right now we don't have any really good solutions for this phenomenon. And it's the kind of thing I find very troubling. But I actually had a recent unlikely encounter that kind of expanded my consciousness, you might say, on how we might tackle this issue. So I was rounding on my patients one morning and I was heading in to see this wonderful 50-something-year-old gentleman with type 2 diabetes. And he was hospitalized for a really bad skin infection called cellulitis, but otherwise he was pretty stable. Um, he wasn't on any continuous drips, he wasn't on a heart monitor, he was on a regular med surge floor. And when I walked into his room, I turned to him and I immediately knew that something was very, very wrong. He was completely gray, and he wasn't breathing, and he had no pulse. He was dead. And I had this brief moment where I freaked out, and then as soon as it was there, it passed immediately, and I went into this autopilot mode. And before I knew it, I was on top of the bed, and I was doing chest compressions. And thank God, it seemed like an eternity, but within 30 seconds, a bunch of people ran into the room that knew what the heck they were doing, and they ran this code, and thank God, he came back. He lived. And I was just left in awe of the situation. And I wasn't in awe of what I had done. I mean, I really feel as if that man was saved, not because of me, but in spite of me. In spite of the fact that that's not what I do. I'm the diabetes lady. I hadn't done chest compressions in forever, and I had never, ever been in that particular situation where I was the first responder. And yet, I felt like I had done it all before. And I did it quickly, and I did the right thing, and it worked. And I couldn't quite wrap my head around that. And then it occurred to me, well, of course I felt like I'd done it before. Of course I did everything quickly and I did it correctly. I had been training for that moment for over 13 years. Yeah, over 13 years since I first became CPR certified. And then every two years, whether I like it or not, I get CPR recertified. And then I began to think, well, if I was that well-trained to save that man's life, how could I train my patients in a similar fashion to save their own lives? So what is CPR? CPR training is a simulation experience, right? It's a simulation experience that many of us in this room have gone through over and over and over again. So how can we give patients beginning pump therapy a similar experience? Well, there's currently a very effective tool being used in some practices called a saline pump start. So in a saline pump start, before the individual begins pump therapy with actual insulin, they wear the pump with just saline in it while they're continuing to give themselves injections for the actual management of their diabetes. And this process really allows people to practice those everyday button pushing mechanics of the pump, like giving themselves a bolus for high blood sugars or carbohydrates or inserting a pump site. It's a very effective tool. People feel more comfortable when they actually begin pump therapy. 
but it does fall short in training individuals to use the advanced features of the pump. And the advanced features are that little something extra about pump therapy that allows people to really tailor insulin delivery to meet every specific situation. And more concerning, it absolutely does nothing to train individuals to deal with adverse events. But what? What if we combine the saline pump experience with readily available mobile app technology? We could create a simulation experience that would be like a diabetic obstacle course for patients. So over a three-day period, the individual is going to wear their saline pump and they're going to be receiving alerts and technology and scenarios through this mobile app on their phone. So the scenarios could include just things about general pump education, but they could also include scenarios where they can use the advanced features of the pump. And most importantly, they would include emergency situations like hypoglycemia or a pump failure or a site occlusion, a kinked catheter, illness management, early DKA. The individual will get the scenario and they're gonna to have to actually work through the scenario in real time. They're gonna to have to actually perform pump functions to navigate their way through the emergency. And then at the end of the experience, they're going to receive immediate feedback after each scenario, saying, hey, you did a great job and here's why. Or, you know, there's a couple things that you didn't do quite right and here's some things you might wanna consider in the future. And then a situation the individual may be found more challenging could be repeated later on that day or the next day until they really develop this familiarity with it. See, this allows pump training and education to be chunked off into those smaller categories and spread out over a whole three-day experience. And by using simulation and by using this technological tool, individuals can try on pump education. They can wear it home. They can see how it looks in their everyday life. So they can see, you know, what does a site occlusion or a kinked catheter look like at 2 p.m. on a Saturday when I'm watching the Buckeye game? But you know, it's not just about the initial training. This process of training has to be reinforced and repeated on a regular basis, just like CPR training does. And you know, when I think about this, this is only a concept, but I think this, something like this could have really helped Andrew. Maybe when that adverse event came knocking at his door, he would have recognized it for what it was. Using a simulation experience in this fashion, it's not only going to improve general pump education, but for the first time, it's going to allow individuals to adequately train for diabetic and pump emergencies. But this, this isn't just about insulin pumps. This is about technology and, and how we use it in medicine. In recent years, we've had this complete windfall of amazing technological development. And it's changing the way that patients interact with their health and with their disease. It's changing lives. But we can't ever lose focus of our objective. Our objective isn't just the acquisition of technology. Our objective is the individual. Because much of this amazing technology that we create will only ever be as good as those hands that hold it. <laughs>